Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the last session of uh, the first day of Next. Hope you guys have had a good time, and uh, I hope you enjoy the, this, this session um, for, uh, for our last, uh, last one of the day. I am Peter Mark Verward. I'm the head of migration architecture here at Google, uh, based out of New York. Um, I'm going to be working with, uh, I'm going to be speaking with, beg your pardon, uh, Ray Wang, Jeff Allen, and Morgante Pell. And what we're going to do is go over cloud foundation and how to automate that foundation um, in the cloud. And what that is, is a, a cloud foundation is what you need to create before you move or create a single compute resource in the cloud. It's what you need to make sure everything's working properly. Uh, I like to use the analogy of a house because I think it really kind of matches up what you're doing in the cloud. It's, uh, if you think about it, the cloud foundation is what you need before you start um, putting in windows, putting in doors, painting, um, all these things. You need a solid foundation, you need plumbing, you need wiring um, before, you want to, before you build a house that's solid. Um, and what we want to do is really go over what will make your house in the cloud solid. So as you can probably guess from my title, uh, I work with a lot of customers who are moving to GCP. And when I work with these customers, we follow a really relatively prescriptive process. And the reason we do this is because it works. Um, it probably doesn't seem particularly different from things you've seen at other companies, um, but consistency uh, around investing in our customers uh, in this plan allows us to do what we do over and over and over again and repeat that success. So when we first engage with customers, we come in, we figure out what you've got. We assess the challenges, limitations of the systems that you have today and find out what your goals and hopes and plans and requirements are for the future. And this is how we get and when we plan what you're going to migrate. This is before anything is done in GCP. This is just a conversation between us and our customers. After that, we build the foundation. We design how we are going to take the solution and technologies available in Google Cloud and connect them to the problems and environments and applications that you have today. And then we establish a place to build all of those applications in a secure and agile manner. And then we help you deploy that. We're never going to go away. So we start working together on a deployment plan to make sure it's successful, to make sure we follow through with the things that we, we planned together, that we discussed together, that we created in the foundation together, and make sure that you have access to technical resources on our side so that those systems work how they're supposed to. And we work through performance, we work through management, we work through operations of all of that. And then we're still not done. Then we start talking about optimization. We start looking at what are the long-term plans? What could you do with what you have? Where would you like to improve? What is not working as well as you would like to? What are the new things that you'd like to try out that you haven't had a chance to try out? And this is a process that continues as our relationship with you continues. This is not something that happens and then we're done. We keep on working with you. And so the optimization is the last step, but it is a last step that is ongoing throughout our relationship with our customers. So today, though, we are just going to focus on that second step, on the foundation. Um, when I engage with customers, I tend to harp on this quite a bit, because I feel like a solid foundation really gives you the flexibility and possibility to have a successful migration. And that requires doing a lot of that work up front. And so while we're just going to focus on the foundation in this session, there are a lot of other sessions happening at Next that you can uh, attend that are going to cover different aspects of kind of the overall migration journey, and we've got a few suggestions at the end of this uh, session that you might be interested in. So let's get to it. What we're going to cover today is the kind of the minute detail of how we're going to build out a foundation. We're going to cover identity and organization in the cloud, and then once you have that part of the foundation, then you start adding on to that network and security. And so these are kind of the very core important parts of your foundation. This is what you need um, to have a, again, what I said, the secure and agile place for your applications to reside. And then what we're going to do is once we've covered all that, we're going to show you how you could automate that entire process and have it spun up um, in a repeatable way with uh, code that you can check in, that you can version, that you can build on, um, and have a foundation in the cloud that you can automate. So, with that, I'd like to hand it off to my colleague, Ray Wang, who will discuss identity and organization. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Ray. I lead the product team at GCP, who work on data policy 
management. As Peter Mark just said, uh, setting up identity, organization, and access policies are the first steps to your GCP migration. So let's walk through them. Now you want to make sure that uh, the data and resources you have on GCP are very secure. So for anybody to access them, first they have to be authenticated and authorized. Authentication and authorization working hand, hand in hand, pretty much like your, your passport and the visa. Authentication proves um, who you are and authorization proves what you have access to. They're also often known as the identity and access management in, in IAM. So for you to authenticate, um, to talk to GCP, you have to have uh, an identity that's understood by GCP. The same identity that you also use to access Gmail and Docs can be used to access GCP APIs as well. And um, if you are an enterprise customer, you need to do more to actually manage and track the identities. Uh, and if you're looking for an IDP, one great option here is to use cloud identity. Um, cloud identity gives you a central place to create and uh, curate and manage the credentials of your company. If you're a GCP only customer, uh, you can take advantage of cloud identities without having to sign up to G Suite. Now, uh, if you use cloud identities, um, because Google manages your logging, you get the benefit of secure logging, password reset, uh, session and device tracking, and uh, can know where and when people have logged in. And because Google tracks the loggings, Google can detect suspicious activities and can be configured to alert you when they happen. So cloud identity is a great option if you're um, a born in a cloud company, don't have an existing IDP, and you're looking for a simple solution. But what if you already have invested in an IDP and you have a process that works for you you want to continue to use? Um, you can continue to use your, your existing IDP with GCP via federation and single sign-on. When single sign-on SSO is configured, whenever a user comes, your, your, one of your identities comes to GCP, they will be redirected to your IDP for authentication. And because it's, it's pretty common that your user has already been authenticated in your own system, that means they will get instant access to GCP APIs. So um, um, for SSO to work, the other thing that needs to exist is uh, the users that you redirect to GCP, they need to have the accounts that's known to Google and they already exist in Google. To help with that, um, we have a tool called GCDS, Google Cloud um, um, Directory Sync, that will help you to automatically sync all of your users and, and groups into Google. Using federation with SSO is a very common configuration used by most of our largest customers with some syncing up to a few hundred thousand accounts. So how do you set it up? Well, setting up SSO is very simple. So there's three links to your existing identity system. Um, and um, you know, SSO is built on top of SAML2. As some of you might know, SAML2 is the secure industry protocol for exchanging user credentials. And the user assertion we care about here is the username. Now, SAML2 also offers the option to um, digitally sign information to prevent tampering. To do that, you can provide um, the information on the digital certificate used to verify your signature. When you do that, you can make sure that all the information uh, coming through SSO is indeed coming from you and has not been tampered with. And what if your system does not support SAML2? Well, you can also use one, um, one of the third-party options, such as Ping and Okta, to bridge the gap here. So, so uh, once you use cloud identity, whether you know, as, a, as your own IDP or whether um, as, as a federation tool, you also get access to uh, other advanced features um, uh, that are offered on top of GCP. One such example is uh, Beyond Corp. Beyond Corp is an enterprise grade um, security model that's based on top of uh, the six years of learning from building zero trust network at Google and combined with the best of breed ideas and practices from the industry. And now Beyond Corp is available to you as a GCP service called IDP, Identity Aware Proxy. Using IDP, your administrators can define which users or groups can, and under which context, such as you know, networking and secure device, can access the applications you have that are running on top of GCP as well. So with all these benefits, how do you get cloud identity? It's fairly simple to you as a GCP customer. You go to the GCP Cloud Console, you click on identity, here you see a page um, on which it has uh, links to all kinds of documentations. You can click navigate to manage your users and groups on Google Admin Console. 
And if you click on the sign up button, it will take you through a guided flow to sign up for cloud entity for your company's domain. At the end of this, this flow, you will also, um, a, a GCP organization will automatically be provisioned for your cloud identity domain. We'll talk more about organizations a little later. And here, you will also have the option to go through guided flows to set up the rest of your, your organization related stuff, such as IAM, organization policies, and billing for a company. So once you have, um, you know, federations, you sign up for a cloud identity, you have federation set up, uh, your users and groups will be synced into Google. And we talked about why users are important, but why do you need to use groups? So we all know that in a large enterprise, you might have you know, thousands or even uh, tens of thousands of users. It will be really cumbersome if you have to manage each individual one of their access. So instead, we want to manage at the group level. Um, groups provide a level of, of abstraction between your, your users and the resources they need to access. So let's take an example. If you have uh, a SecOp team, they need uh, the, the, secure, the security admin role on your organization so they can configure the security settings for organization. And that team has 10 people. So what you wanna do is to create a group, have these 10 members join a group, and then assign a group security admin role on your organization. Now, if after that you have new members joining the group, all you have to do is to add a user to the group. You don't have to go and assign the user individual permissions they need on different resources. They auto automatically inherit what the group has. Now, what about if the team's job function changes? Now, they also need the log viewer role so that they can uh, watch for you know, critical admin uh, setting changes. All you need to do is to assign the log viewer role to the SecOp team group on your organization. Again, you won't have to go and change the setting for the individual users. You can manage groups either um, through you know, cloud identity or in your own IDP via federation. But in either case, you want to make sure that, that you safeguard your group membership uh, by setting additional policies such as um, the policy to prevent outside identities from joining your company's domain groups or um, the permissions on who is able to create new groups of their own. So we talked about users and groups. There is a third type of identity that's often used with GCP, which is service accounts. So unlike users groups, which are identities for human beings, your service accounts are the identities for your automations and programs that are running on top of GCP. Um, your users can type the username and password to log in. Your service accounts is not gonna sit in front of a screen type. So instead, they use keys to authenticate. One or more service account keys can be created for each service account. And since using these keys, you basically are granting people access to your sensitive data and resources, you wanna make sure that you safeguard the keys. If you run applications on top of Google with you know, GAE or GCE or GKE, we will keep your keys secure and then automatically rotate them every few hours. So that way you don't have to download your keys and you don't have to risk losing or leaking your keys. What if you run applications elsewhere in a hybrid cloud environment that happens quite often? Well, you can, you can download the keys to be used from your applications so your application can access GCP. However, uh, here you really need to be careful about uh, where you store those keys they give access to sensitive data. So you want to store them in a secure service such as you know, maybe a vault. Um, and what you don't want to do is just to store them in plain text on GitHub. The other interesting thing about service account is that it's not only an identity, it's also a resource. So when you have a VM that's running as a service account, here the service account is acting as the identity. The VM you, you assumes the service account identity to get access to, to resources and, and, and uh, APIs. However, at the same time, you also want to be able to control which users, uh, which VMs are able to assume this identity. So here the service account acts as a resource and you can grant access to the service account by granting the service, the service account act as role. Now, a, a very common way of using service account is with GC VMs. When you use service account to, to run your GC VMs, um, you can sub-partition all the VMs in a project into different components with different identities. For example, if you have one component uh, that needs to access a GCS bucket and a different component that needs to access a BigQuery data set, you can assign each one a different identity and then grant each identity the least privilege required. You can change the service count on VM without having to restart a VM. And later on in the network section, we're gonna talk about how to use these attributes of the service counts to create more secure firewall rules. So once you have your identity domain, your identity's domain set up with GCP, an organization is automatically created for you. The GCP organization is the root node 
for all the resources in your company. So all of your VMs, buckets, and the projects, and so on live under the organization. There's a one-to-one -one relationship between the identity domain and the GCP organization. And using this relationship, we're able to enforce rules such that um, all the projects and the, the resources that are created by your company's employees will belong to your organization node. And this ensures that there's no more uh, rogue admins or hidden projects. The central admin will have um, control and visibility to everything. So more about the resource hierarchy. Well, we talked about you don't want to manage individual users. You also don't want to manage individual VMs and storage objects. Right? You can end up with thousands of them in, in the case of objects, millions of them. They're cattle, not pets. So to scale out your operation, you want to be able to run operations and set policies on a group level. And the most common way of grouping resources in GCP um, is through the resource hierarchy. At the bottom level, you have your VMs and, and storage objects and, and uh, buckets. Above that, you have projects. Projects are the most basic unit for ownership and policies in, in GCP. They're often used to um, simulate a team or environment or service. And about projects, you have folders. Um, they're hierarchical, and they can be used to model your departments or organization units. Uh, and then above the folders, you have the organization node, which is, again, your root node. So once you have set up your resource hierarchy, uh, it makes a lot of the organization-wide um, management tasks much simpler. For example, you can control who in your company is or is not allowed to start new projects and create additional resources. You can do so by assigning the project creator role at each of the levels in your hierarchy. You can also uh, automate the building of an inventory of your resources and policies by programmatically traversing through um, the org, the folders, and projects, and the resources, and so on. Another common practice is to assign a service account, um, the, the permissions on the org level, so the service account can go and patrol the, the um, configurations in your organization to enforce compliance. And in fact, this is what uh, the Google's, Google's own security team does to manage our google.com GCP resources as well. So resource hierarchy is great. It defines a very strict ownership hierarchy, and it gives you policy inheritance. But there are many times you also need to define other relationships that are outside of the hierarchy. For example, you can have two departments, um, you know, your storefront um, team and, and your inventory service, each of which can have a, a production environment versus a dev test environment. How do you define these environments? Well, a common way of doing that is via labels. Labels are key value pairs that are user defined and can be attached to resources. So in this case, you can assign environment equal to you know, prod versus, versus dev to the different um, you know, projects in the two different departments. Once you have assigned labels, you can search um, for resources based on your labels. And labels are also included in billing export, so you can use that to do cost aggregation for your different efforts and initiatives. So once we have the resource hierarchy and labels, we can also define you know, hierarchical policies. Uh, some examples here, IAM, um, Identity Access Management, organization policies, which is about constraining the configurations in your company, and hierarchical quota. So IAM um, is the policy that uh, allows you to, to tell who can do what on which resources. The who part refers to identities, and the resource part can be defined by either individual resources like VMs and buckets or hierarchy, uh, hierarchical nodes such as projects and folders. The can do what part in the middle is defined by an IAM role. An IAM role often maps to a job function, for example, if you are uh, the instance admin for a team. And it is, it is constructed as um, a group of permissions. So here, if you need to manage all the instances for department, you need to be able to you know, get and list them, start and stop them, and so on. So we group up these permissions together and make them an IAM role. In this example here, you can see that we're assigning the instance admin role to a number of users uh, on a project A, which means these users can then use the role to manage, uh, to run operations on the instances in this project. Now, GCP ships out of the box over 100 curated roles that have been built for you. Um, hopefully, it will map to a lot of your um, job functions. But if you need more, you can also build custom roles um, to specifically tailor uh, roles that, are, that match your business needs. So another uh, new capability to IAM that we're going to be launching in the next few days, this is a sneak preview, is IAM conditions. IAM conditions allow you to further restrict um, the, the access that IAM grants by additional either client or resource attributes. 
So for example, I can assign Peter Mark um, storage admin on a bucket, but with the condition that he can only access the objects that match a particular prefix. So you can grant sub bucket level IAM that way. You can also use conditions to do uh, context aware access. For example, you can assign permission to access particularly sensitive resources, but only when the client traffic is coming from a trusted network, maybe a company's VPN. And later on in the network section, we're also going to be talking about how to use contact aware um, with your VPC to set the boundary at your organization level as well. Another common use of conditions is to set time-bound access policies. So you can grant temporary access and have it auto expire when time is up. This is often used, for example, if you're an admin for the break glass situation or to time with your team's on-call rotations. So IAM policy focuses on the I, on the identity. It differentiates access based on who you are. Its sibling organization policy allows the admin to set secure configuration constraints for the organization. It differentiates based on resources and applies to all the identities that access a particular resource. Organization constraints can be set on the org level and it will be inherited into all of the projects and resources underneath. And it can also be either augmented or overridden uh, on the other organization levels, such as folders and projects. So here are some examples of the organization policy that are available today. You can, for example, uh, limit um, the usage of VM nested virtualization or external IP serial port. You can also use it to control your IAM policies, for example, uh, preventing external identities from uh, being added to the access of your company's resources or prevent the creation of uh, service accounts or keys in a particular project. So let's look at one of, the, one of the main more details, the restricted VM trusted image policy. So if you use GC, you might already be aware of the GC image sharing feature, uh, which allows you to curate your images under one project and share it with the other VMs in, in the other projects. Now, once you've set up the corresponding ARC policies, uh, you can whitelist a set of projects hosting the VMs that are allowed to be used as a safe for your organization. Um, for example, you can limit it to only the VMs that are published by Google, or, you, or only the projects containing VMs that have been fully tested and blessed by your security team. And once you have configured uh, this policy, the next time your developers come and try to spin on VM, they will only be, uh, be able to choose from these safe images that you have defined via policy. Okay, so that was a lot. Let's put them together and look at an end-to-end -end example of how to configure um, identities, organization, and access policies for an enterprise company. So if you run an enterprise company, you probably have multiple levels of organizations that are built up over the years. Uh, in this day and age, you probably care about security and privacy and separation of duty. And you likely also already have existing on-prem assets and processes that your cloud deployments need to be able to work with. So this is a typical setup. You might have your um, on-prem LDAP system hosting identities and then federate them into Google via cloud identity. And an organization node will be set up to match your cloud identity account um, and it will give your admins uh, central visibility and control of all your resources. Organization policies can be set up to prevent unsafe configurations from your organization and, and protect uh, compliance and security requirements. And it is often that uh, procurement decisions are made at the org level centrally, um, right, instead of every developer deciding what to use on their own. And then um, resource provisioning, as well as uh, major configuration changes, are driven through existing processes, such as a ticketing system or a CI-CD pipeline. Now, the benefit of doing that is that your developers then won't need to have direct access to the actual resources, especially in a production environment. Instead, they can request that all the changes um, be driven through um, existing you know, automated workflows and everything will leave a trace through your Git repo, your CI CD pipeline. And then you can set up your folders and projects to model your teams and departments uh, so that they can have very separate policies as well as different cost allocation. So if you have your HR department with their apps and your storefront department with their apps, you can make sure that they, they can each get very different um, you know, access levels and uh, compliance policies. And uh, when, you, when it comes to billing time, you can also uh, figure out how much each department has spent. So that was a quick tour through setting up identities, organization, access policies for organization. 
Another important step in your migration uh, will be figuring out how to configure network settings. So for that, let's welcome on stage Jeff Allen. Hi, uh, I'm Jeff Allen. I'm a solutions architect here at Google Cloud. And what we're going to talk about is building on this uh, conversation of identity and organization, talk about some of the foundations and some of the foundational decisions we need to make in the area of, of network and security. Focusing really on three primary topics, uh, the topology, the structure and the layout of, of our network, um, as well as network connectivity. As we design this network to interact with other systems, um, how are we going to create that connectivity? And uh, in regards to security, how are we going to do access control and auditing and, and have visibility into what's going on uh, in those uh, environments? So let's start this topology discussion by looking at the Google Cloud Global Network. Now, you may have seen this uh, kind of depiction before where we've got all of our regions up here along with the points of presence where you can ingress onto the Google private network. And all the lines connecting the dots are the miles of our uh, private fiber subsea cables that really create what differentiates the Google Cloud platform, this global network with very low latency, single hop routing uh, around the globe. And it's this uh, network which provides the backbone for your global VPCs on a Google Cloud Platform. Now, if you're interested in this map, by the way, I will call out that you can get a copy of it, a poster, if you're interested. Uh, so if you go to this link, this uh, g.co slash poster, uh, in the US, we'll mail you a free copy of that like wall size poster. And uh, if you're not, you can still download a high res image that you could use with your own large format printer to, to print your own poster. So if you want to have one of those hanging on your wall, uh, check out this link. So it's within that global network where we define our VPCs, our virtual private clouds. Those are the network uh, environments where we'll launch our resources. But the, the resources themselves tend to exist in uh, what we call subnets. And the subnets aren't global, they are regional resources. So we define subnets in each region where we uh, intend to maintain some kind of a compute presence. Uh, the, the, the subnets span the zones uh, within those regions. Uh, but here's where we have some decisions to make about the topology of our network. How big do our subnets need to be? How many subnets do we need? And what regions do we want those subnets to exist? So we've got to consider uh, our own you know, organization-specific requirements to make those decisions. But there are some best practices to keep in mind. Certainly, we'll want to have subnets available in each of the regions where we intend uh, our teams to maintain uh, compute presence. They'll need to be sized appropriately and considering growth, but they're easily extended if you need to add additional address space uh, to a subnet. Our, our subnets, um, as we consider how to connect these networks with our other networks, a topic we'll look at momentarily, uh, that relies in general on having non-overlapping IP address ranges. So we'll want to work within our own addressing scheme allocate some subnets, uh, some subnets uh, specific to GCP. So when you start connecting this back on-prem, you have non-overlapping address spaces to use. And also consider drawing perimeters around the network segments where you may want to control which segments have access to the internet, which segment, segments are internal only, which segments maybe have some special protection because of some compliance framework that uh, that we're audited against. And uh, d divide up our environment into these segments. And we'll look uh, throughout this presentation at how we can use uh, network routes and firewalls to create those, uh, those segments within, within our environment. Another consideration uh, regarding network topology is the relationship of our networks to our project structure. Ray just showed us how these projects exist within a hierarchy of folders in our organization. Now, the VPC is a resource that's owned by a project. Uh, and you certainly can have your VM instances and your VPC network in the same project if you choose. But in many cases, because of this desire for separation of duties, that's not the way we tend to see enterprise customers deploying their, their networks. There's this feature called shared VPC, which allows you to define what we call a host project. And that host project is the one that owns the network. Uh, this may be owned by a network security team. They define the network, the subnets, the firewall rules. And then they share access 
to what we call service projects. And these service projects may be owned by the individual application and workload teams. They're allowed to launch resources into the shared VPC, but they themselves don't have uh, access to configure uh, the, the network itself. Now that we've got an idea of the way we're going to lay out our subnets, we want to start thinking about how the resources located inside those subnets are going to interact with other resources in other networks. Now, in this scenario, we're interested in having uh, our resources in our VPC subnets interacting with resources that may exist in a different VPC, maybe within our same project or a different project within our org, or maybe even a VPC uh, that's owned by one of our partners. It may not even be ours, but if both parties agree uh, to establish this peering connection, then you can have seamless routing over the RFC 1918 addresses between these two VPCs, allowing resources in one VPC to communicate with resources in, in the other. It's one way to establish that kind of connectivity. But what if we want the resources in our VPC to be able to communicate with Google APIs? For instance, Google Cloud Storage or BigQuery. We've got instances, and we want them to be able to interact with those APIs. Well, if we provide uh, an external public routable IP address and a route through our internet gateway, certainly those instances could egress to the internet and interact with the Google APIs. But in many cases, we don't want instances egressing directly to the internet. So how can we provide access to Google APIs without internet connectivity? Private Google Access provides us the way to do that. This is a subnet level setting, and when it's enabled, the instances in that subnet, even without an external IP address, can egress through the internet gateway to the, specifically the Google APIs, not the internet uh, at large. So this is a way of providing connectivity uh, between your instances and Google APIs without the instances actually having full internet uh, connectivity. But in many cases, we do want those instances to be able to communicate uh, with the uh, internet. And one way of accomplishing that without providing each individual instance a publicly routable IP address is to route their traffic through what we call a NAT gateway. Now, a NAT gateway is just uh, an instance that itself is configured with an internet routable address bootstrapped to forward traffic. And then you configure that instance as the next hop address for the internet, the routing of internet-bound traffic from within your VPC. You could do a single NAT gateway, but in many cases, concerns for resiliency and greater bandwidth would uh, have us uh, deploy multiple NAT gateways, like we see here, where we might deploy three NAT gateways, one in each zone within the region where we're, our subnet exists. Uh, each of these NAT gateways is deployed in a managed instance group with health checks, so that they'll be health checked, and if those health checks start to fail, that instance will be replaced. And additionally, when we configure the routing through these NAT gateways, we're going to configure them all with an equal priority. And that's going to allow us to leverage ECMP, or equal cost multipath routing, which is going to distribute our outbound traffic across the aggregate bandwidth of all of these NAT instances. So it becomes horizontally scalable. If you need more uh, bandwidth to egress to the internet, you just add additional NAT gateways with the same priority. Now, what if we want connectivity not to the internet, but to resources that exist on-prem, so data center resources. We want to create connectivity uh, between our VPC and the data center. There's a number of ways to do it. Uh, we've got a VPN solution. There are layer three peering solutions. Note, there's no SLA for those. So in many cases, we recommend the layer two interconnect uh, solutions. And there's this decision tree, which can be useful to help us evaluate which of these five options are appropriate for us. Now, on the left-hand side of the decision tree is where we're exploring the peering options. In many cases, these are used in cases where um, we want to establish low latency interactions for the G Suite APIs, for our end users of G Suite, Google Docs, and Google Sheets. 
So for the purposes of, of today's presentation, we're really going to focus more on the right-hand side of this decision tree, which is going to help us decide, well, is cloud VPN appropriate? Or maybe a full 10 gigabit dedicated interconnect? Or if we don't need 10 gigabits of bandwidth, maybe uh, just the fractional bandwidth of a partner interconnect. But we'll also see momentarily how you might use some of these together. You might start with a cloud VPN and then move to an interconnect related solution. Um, and I'll show you a, a kind of common pathway along that uh, journey from cloud VPN to, to interconnect. So what is cloud VPN? Cloud VPN is our IPsec uh, connectivity uh, option where you create a, a cloud router in GCP and a VPN gateway. And then you configure any number of, of tunnels between that VPN gateway and your on-prem routers. This allows you to have RFC 1918 connectivity. It's encrypted because of the IPsec. And it also allows you to provide resilience in your environment because you can define multiple tunnels. If you have multiple routers, you can define a tunnel to each. You can also use ECMP again if you need a higher bandwidth solution. You can expect between 1.5 and 3 gigabits per tunnel, but if you need additional bandwidth, you can configure multiple tunnels with equal priorities in their routing configuration, which will again cause uh, our, our routing to distribute the traffic across the aggregate bandwidth of those tunnels. So the other option that we're going to focus on here is dedicated interconnect. Now this is a physical link in a colo facility where you have a router, Google has a router, we cross-connect those routers, and you can get a full dig, uh, 10 gigabit uh, link uh, between your environments. We've got dedicated internet, connect, uh, uh, inter dedicated interconnect locations uh, around the globe. And you can check the website. We're you know, frequently adding additional uh, locations. But remember we said that interconnect is, in many cases, preferred because there are supported configurations with Interconnect where there's a, a, an availability SLA. So let's take a look at a couple of those configuration options. So this would be the dedicated, internet, um, de dedicated Interconnect configuration uh, if you're looking for three nines of availability. Notice in green, we've got uh, your router in the Colo facility. Blue, we've got the, the Google uh, router. Notice there are two links, not a single link, because there's no SLA for a single link configuration, but we've got two links configured there. And those two links have to fit specific requirements. There are two links that go into separate physical zones within the same metro. If you notice that those dedicated interconnect locations were defined in a metro area, and we use those metro areas for purposes of uh, availability planning, like with maintenance cycles and things like that. So you would have a link into two links into the same metro, but into different physical zones within that metro. And that configuration will give us three nines of availability. If we want to extend that beyond three nines, and we're interested in four nines of availability, what we'd essentially do is duplicate that configuration. Notice now what we've done is introduced a secondary region. So we've got a similar configuration where we've got multiple links into two different physical zones in the same metro, but then we've doubled it in another region, two more links into two different physical zones within a different metro in a different region. And by configuring things that way because of the additional geo redundancy, this configuration is supported with four nines uh, of availability in the SLA. We also discussed that uh, path from VPN to interconnect, which is a common journey many of our customers take. Because sometimes when you're just starting out with a proof of concept or early in the project, it's very easy to stand up a VPN tunnel, get that private connectivity initially going. But as that proceeds, as the initiative gains momentum, as you're formalizing your platform, in many cases, you want to follow that up with something like a, a dedicated inter interconnect. Now, it's, it's, uh, this is going to show us a way where you can do that and transition seamlessly from a cloud VPN to a dedicated interconnect. Uh, what we've basically set up here is a cloud VPN. It's pretty standard. We've got a couple of tunnels set up. Notice we're using ECMP routing, as we discussed. 
The only thing that's really unusual here is that we've set our BGP med, or the priority, as we call it, to 100 instead of its default value of 1,000. You'll see why that matters when we bring the interconnect online. When we bring the interconnect online, we bring it online with its default priority of 1,000. So even as those routes start to be advertised by GCP, the um, priority 100 routes are going to be preferred. So your traffic's still going to be flowing over the VPN. And then when you're ready for the interconnect solution to go live, you just reverse the priority values. Set the VPN priority to 1,000. Set the, internet, uh, the interconnect priority to uh, 100. And by doing that now, the interconnect routes will be preferred. At that point, you could potentially turn the VPN solution off, or in many cases, we'll see customers leave it there as a backup, a fail-safe. It still works. If something happened to the uh, interconnect route, um, the, the cloud VPN routes would then be uh, able to service the traffic. So we've explored topology. We've explored connectivity. We also want to explore some of the security-related foundations in GCP. Uh, one of the common resources that we're going to use is uh, our firewalls. Now, this slide is kind of showing us, uh, on the left-hand side, a traditional enterprise model where you might have a firewall appliance and you route traffic through that appliance. In the cloud, we prefer distributed systems. We like to avoid those kinds of choke points and single points of failure. So it's interesting in GCP that firewalls are implemented as a distributed system. There's not a firewall appliance. You could run a virtual appliance if you wanted that. But GCP's firewalls are distributed, enforced on the host, based on rules that you define. And those rules allow you to specify uh, the source of the traffic, the destination of the traffic, protocols and ports, allow or deny that traffic, and then target that rule to a specific instance or set of instances. There's a couple of ways to do that. Um, could do that, uh, you know, all VMs in a, in a network. You could do that with target tags. Tags are little just text values that you um, tag onto the, onto the instance. So you could say web server and use that web server to target like a port 80 or 443 rule. You can also target service accounts. Remember, Ray introduced service accounts as the identity that we specify when we launch that virtual machine. So that virtual machine runs in the context of that service account identity. And we can actually target firewall rules to that service account identity or to instances running in that service account identity. And we'll see on the next slide that's actually our preferred way of targeting firewall rules for the reason that tags are mutable. You can change the tags on an instance. And by changing the tags, you're potentially changing the firewall rules that are being enforced on that instance. And if we want to be really sure that the firewall rules are defined appropriately and being used appropriately in our environments, if we target service accounts instead, service accounts have uh, control in, in IAM, we can specify which users are allowed to launch instances in which specific service accounts. And service accounts can't be changed on a running instance. In order to change a service account, you have to stop the instance first and then start it again. And for that reason, if we target our firewall rules to service accounts, we've got tighter controls over the configuration of those rules and who is allowed to, say, launch a web server, who is allowed to launch a server you know, according to other, other rules. This slide is introducing an alpha feature. You may or may not have heard of it. There'll be some uh, discussion of it at some of the other breakout sessions here next. But this is firewall logging. So this is a feature that you can enable per firewall rule. And when it's enabled, firewall logging will create a record of every decision when a connection is either allowed or denied because of that rule. Firewall logging is going to log that decision. And then you can define filters that would select all or some of those firewall logging records and direct them to your, uh, to, to Stackdriver logging, to PubSub, GCS, BigQuery, wherever you want those, those logs to be accumulated. So this is a great way to have visibility into 
the security decisions that are being made within this environment that you've defined. Another uh, logging feature that provides us visibility into our uh, VPC network environments is VPC flow logs. Now, VPC flow logs provide us a five-second five second aggregated report for each what we call a five-tuple flow. Now, five-tuple is a way that we kind of uniquely identify a flow of traffic. That's a, the five-tuple is the, the source, address, and port the destination address and port, and the protocol. Right? And that five-tuple uniquely identifies the flow of traffic. So for each five-tuple flow, every five seconds, you'll get a log record that shows you the, the bytes transferred, the packets, um, you know, additional annotations for the VPCs and the geographic uh, information of, 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 that, uh, of that traffic. And again, you can configure that using Stack Driver to filter some or all of those records and direct them to your appropriate uh, repository to keep those records available for your analytics queries. One final um, feature that we'll discuss, again, this is a, a feature that's in beta, private beta now. And this is an interesting way. We talked before about the idea of perimeters. And as we begin to sort of segment our environments and think about security perimeters, how do we enforce those perimeters? Let's imagine a scenario where we have created a VPC network. We've got VM instances running in that network. And we've allowed them to egress uh, either via private Google access or through NAT or even with a public IP address, we've allowed them to egress and interact with our Google APIs, right? So we've got VMs running in the VPC, and they can interact with Google Cloud Storage. They can write data into buckets, read data from buckets. How do we know that the buckets that those VMs are writing data to are actually buckets that are owned by our company? Right? What's preventing data exfiltration? What's preventing a, a rogue script from uploading data into some bucket that's actually not owned by our company. That's what VPC service controls are for. It allows us to define a service perimeter. And that service per perimeter is essentially a grouping of resources, including the, the resources running in our VPC, the buckets, and, and, and other GCP resources. And it's only within that service perimeter that resources are allowed to interact. So this would, for instance, Make sure that instances in our VPC can interact only with company-owned buckets. And in fact, instances in other VPCs or traffic from the internet at large would not be able to interact with those buckets because that traffic comes from outside the uh, service perimeter. But you can extend that service perimeter if you do want to extend it uh, to allow traffic in from the internet, like for web serving scenarios. That's supported. Or if you want to extend it even to your on-premises network. So your data center network can become part of that service perimeter. That's supported as well. But this tool allows you to then draw that boundary and create that collection of resources uh, and, and harden that, that perimeter. Uh, and so this will be an important uh, new feature uh, for our network security. So hopefully that intro has given us a, a feel for some of the design decisions that we have to make, and some of the features and tools that we have in GCP to help you create your network foundations, create your security foundations. Now I want to turn the floor over to my colleague, Morgante, who's going to show us how to automate some of these deployments. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. So we spent a lot of time talking today about how you can set up an effective organizational hierarchy and set up your network. But maintaining this over time can be a lot of work if you don't have some automation in place that allows you to enforce the best practices across your organization. So every time you're onboarding new users, onboarding new projects into GCP, you can have that done automatically and have your codified best practices. So putting your automation in place gives a lot of benefits. 
if it's in source control, you can actually collaborate on it. You can have pull requests, you can have suggestions of changes to policies or changes to your network topology, all collaborated through a pull request instead of having to only have it in conversations or through manual actions. You can also ensure consistency. You can make sure that every single project you're creating in GCP has the exact same consistent settings, the right subnets, the right IAM permissions, the right rules set up for that defined exactly in code. You can also reduce the manual effort. Instead of having a single person go in and provision a new, new service account or a new service project, you can just have the code automatically do that in a very consistent and automatable way and then even enforce policies proactively. So if you're saying any of our dev projects can only get access to the dev VPC, if that's coded into your modules and into your infrastructure as code, you can be confident that every time you're creating those new projects, they're not accidentally getting access to networks or resources they shouldn't have access to. So this is what one of those pipelines might look like. You'd have a set of common modules or templates for what a project looks like in your organization or what a uh, network or subnet looks like in your organization, and you combine them with configs specific to a particular application use case. So you could have a, for example, uh, subnetwork uh, that's, that's defined that every time you're creating a subnetwork for your dev testing, uh, that has to have certain names, and then you'd have, you'd have a service account that's creating the firewall rules, and that can be combined together with a config specific to the application. So you take those, the configuration and the modules together, combine them into a plan, and then take that plan and deploy it, assuming it looks good, to a non-product environment, to a dev environment, where you can actually see it deployed, see, oh, great, we've got the right resources, we've got the right project, and then once it's looking good, you can actually deploy that same exact code, that same exact infrastructure's code, and promote it into your production environment. So to take that code and put it the same way you have an application release cycle, you can have an infrastructure release cycle. Cool. So projects and policies are some of the things that benefit most from this. Right? So if you stamp out projects in a very standardized, consistent way, you can minimize the proliferation of sensitive owner roles. So instead of having to have individuals going and creating projects, in which case they by default get owner on that new project, you can have a service account which is creating the projects from code and make sure that only people who actually need access to the project get access to it, and by default, nothing besides the service account has access to it. You can also ensure that you have access to shared resources, like the shared VPC, or if you have a common standardized image bucket where you are, have sort of blessed companies' base images, you can make sure all new projects and the service accounts in those projects get access to that. And this can be automated with Deployment Manager, Terraform, or our public APIs, and your own tooling using those public APIs. So an example flow for a new project might be create the project, uh, create a Google App Engine app in that project if your company is using App Engine, enable billing on the project, and associate with the appropriate billing account, enable any allowed APIs and only the allowed APIs on that project, and then create specific service accounts for that project. Um, and then finally, if you actually wanna have developers say, be able to only view the logs in that project, you could have the same project factory process actually create, set the IAM policies on the new project and give the right people access to it. So this is sort of like talking about sort of that methodology of how your projects as code, right? Instead of projects only going through the UI, you can have an actual process where somebody wants a new project. You say you have a new team that they want to get access to GCP. They're really excited to start developing their code. Uh, what they would do is they could go to a central projects repo where all the projects that you want in GCP are listed. They'd make up their own branch, make some changes to add their own project listed in there, and then make a pull request, right, that says, I want to add this project. And then you could have some automated tooling that first looks at that pull request and says, okay, good, it's on the right subnets, it has the right configuration, it looks good from the automated perspective, and then have a central team actually go in and manually review that pull request, make sure that everything looks good there, right? So that you have both the automated and the manual sign-off on it, and then once it looks good, you actually merge that pull request, right? And then once it's actually merged into the master branch is when it actually gets created from the service account. So no individuals are creating projects, it's always going through a pipeline through code. Um, and if you want to learn more about that, we actually have a section on Thursday um, that's actually talking about how we apply those same principles of um, policy as code to Kubernetes and taking those same principles of a pull request workflow for changing your policies. So this works really well for proactive defense, right? If you have policies that are defined through code and you're proactively finding any problems as you're um, creating new infrastructure, 
that's really great, right? But there can be drift over time. People can have, there might be some legacy organization admins, there might be some um, different services running. GCP sometimes even changes certain things. Um, for example, if you're acting, activating Kubernetes engine, that will create some service accounts on your project. Uh, so you also wanna have reactive visibility and detection of any, pro any policy violations. Um, that's why we have an open source tool called Forseti, which can actually do that violation detection um, retrospectively. It works by doing first, building inventory, right? So it has an inventory of all the resources um, all the way down to the individual VM or firewall rule level um, within your entire organization and takes that inventory and can actually run policy analysis over it. So you can say, all right, here's all the firewall rules in my organization. I should have no firewall rules that target IP ranges because we've decided to have the best practice that only firewall rules only target service accounts, right? So you, you could have that as one of your policies and for study could flag any rule that violates that policy and then in some cases, um, in, mo in all cases where there's a policy violation, would notify you, so notify administrators with an email, um, but al also could actually even automatically enforce that. So bring it back into a compliance state, into compliance with your code, code policies in a really effective way. Um, so that works for GC firewalls, and we're adding more over time. Uh, and there's also a Forsetti section on Thursday, if you guys are interested in checking that out and diving really deep into what Forsetti can do to help you have automated policy analysis. So we're talking a lot about how you can automate all these things together, right? Um, obviously, you know, Google supports this. We want you to be able to have your infrastructure defined in code, which is why we have Google Deployment Manager. It's our hosted native tool for creating our infrastructure as code. Um, and we can actually, it's a hosted service, right? So there's a UI for it, same as any of our other projects. So you can go into the cloud console and find information about Deployment Manager, see all of your existing deployments, and even see what the status of those deployments is. So what resources did they create? What configuration values are passed into those deployments? And one thing that's really cool about Deployment Manager is it's totally API driven. It's not custom logic for each individual API that's integrated with. It's using the same public APIs that you see in our API docs to actually call those services. The really big advantage of that is when, you know, you hear it next, right? You're hearing about people coming out with new features for all of our different products all the time. Um, when those are added to an existing API, the Deployment Manager can immediately get support for those new features because it's just calling the underlying API. So if there's a new property added to a particular API, it'll immediately be able to call that API and get access. So you're not being time boxed, and you're not being, having to wait for the automation to catch up with where you're at, uh, which is a huge benefit to being able to adopt automation across the board for all of your infrastructure. And templates, of course, you know, back to our, when we first started talking, we want to have these all be templatized. You want to have things in a very consistent way. You're not custom writing config for every single deployment you want to do. You want to have reusable templates across the company. Those can be written in Python, so really expressive, full language, right? You've got all the power of Python to create your templates for Deployment Manager. Um, but if you want something a little bit simpler, there's also Jinja 2 templates, which I can show some examples of here. Cool. So this is an example of some of the uh, deployment types that we have. So on the left here, is if you want to do that sort of project creation hierarchy, right? We were talking about how you want to stamp out products in a very consistent way. This is how you do it with a Python template in Deployment Manager. So notice here we take in a couple parameters. We take in a project ID, a project name, and a folder ID. So we say we want to put this into our dev folder, for example, and we want to create that. Um, we can take those parameters in and actually have a Deployment Manager through this common template, do the correct association, create that project in the correct folder, and actually even here, it's at the end, it's a little bit cut off, but um, you can even do the billing account association. So create that project and then attach it to the correct billing account for that, as part of that template. Um, now if you want to go a little bit more advanced, right, you're you know, going really deep into service accounts and doing really advanced custom roles and you, know, you've, you've sort of pushed in the box so you want to make, have a very clear definition of what a service account, what permissions it is, you can start doing IAM custom roles. So if you want to create a custom role, that can be done through the UI, but again, we want to think about things as policy. We want these policies to be in code, right? So if it's in code, it's much easier to know what that role is and change the permissions associated with that role over time. So that's why on the right here, we have an example of a Jinja template for creating a custom role, right? Where we take in um, some properties within the curly braces there, like a role ID, a title for the role, some of the permissions that are included in that role, um, all through the curly braces there on the side, right? Now what's really cool about Deployment Manager templates is we want them to be reusable, right? So you want to be able to switch them between multiple contexts. That's why, as you can see here, there's the env part, right? It can actually pick up the current project from the current context by referencing the env part there. Um, that just allows you to take that same template, run it against different projects, and actually have those, those roles be created in the correct current project. So it just allows a lot of flexibility to actually have these templates adapt over time. Um, so we've got a lot of examples of these. Uh, if you go on GitHub, we've published 
dozens, and we're publishing more every day, of samples of how you can use Deployment Manager to automate these things. Now, Google, of course, wants to make sure that we have a hosted, supported solution for this, but we also embrace the open source community. We, we know there's other tools out there that can support all these tools, which is why we even have teams at Google that work on maintaining really strong support for these open source tooling in GCP. So Terraform is an example of this, where we, we want to make sure there's a really strong integration between Terraform and GCP, so that over time you can very easily use Terraform to define all of your infrastructure and have it be configured automatically. So this is an example of how you could use a service account credentials file. So that's a JSON credentials file that you download from GCP to authenticate Terraform to access our APIs, right? And you can figure the project that it's accessing there. And then down below, we see an example of actually how you create a project in Terraform, right? So you would say, this is the project ID. This is the billing account ID that I want to attach that project to, and an org ID, and then a name for that project. And that can be done very, very easily in Terraform. Um, and one of my personal things that I really like to do is actually have bindings declared in code. So you don't have people going manually and saying, oh, I want project admin, and somebody just does that randomly and nobody even knows that they granted that role. You can actually do it all through Terraform code here, where you have a Google project IM binding saying that only the people defined in this role, um, in this case, Jane at example.com, get the project editor role on that project. And um, so it can be done totally in code. And one of the things that this actually will do with the project IM binding is wipe out any other policies. So if somebody went in and manually gave themselves editor, but they're not defining the code, the next time the code is run, they'll, that binding will be removed. Right? It makes sure that only the people who are supposed to have the role have the role, and that you always do it through the code instead of doing it manually. So one of the things Jeff talked about was that really our best practice for having secure firewall rules is do them through service accounts. Right? You don't want to have people going in and editing network tags and allowing their VM to egress wherever it wants, ingress wherever it wants. You want to have some security controls over who can do certain firewall rules. So this is an end-to-end -end example of how you could do that. Right? You could take a, up here in the top left, you'd actually just create the service account. Right? You give it an account ID, and you give it a display name for that service account. Right? And then down below, you'd actually do a binding of who can access that service account, who can take the service account actor, user role and is able to launch VMs with that service account. So this is saying only our web app devs are allowed to want, launch service accounts using the web app service account, right? So they, you know, another team that is not authorized to use that can't go and con like create VMs because they don't have the service account user role on that service account. So this gives you access control of who can actually do it. And then finally, you have the firewall rule defined to allow ingress on port 80 for that service account, which gives you a lot of flexibility that you, know, you don't want anybody to be able to open their service account up to their VM up to the internet. You only want people who have that role and have that binding defined to be able to actually allow internet ingress into their, net, into their service. Cool. So now I just want to skip into a demo where we can actually show you guys how some of this works. Cool. So here's my Terraform config. We're going to be using Terraform today to show off some of the features. I um, just want to show how I actually have my Terraform backend state stored in GCS. And then here's how we actually can define our whole resource hierarchy within Terraform, right? So we, we want to have multiple folders. In this case, we're doing a split between prod and dev. So we define our prod folder up here, and we define a dev folder down here. And then we ex have an existing folder. Maybe we have a web team, right? They've got, some, they've got all their dev resources within that folder, and you can apply policies to that folder. Now let's say we want to add an additional folder just for our demo today. So you know, we're doing some demo at next 18. So we could do you know, demo, demo dev 18. And we want to keep it in the dev folder, right? So it's still going to be a nested folder underneath the dev, dev, dev folder. So that's gonna, you know, this is all I need to do to add a new folder. It's all defined in code. And theoretically, if this was a production environment, I'd be doing pull requests for these parts. Right? So I, t I have that folder created. And then I actually want to create a project within that folder. So, this is where I take this sort of standardized config that I have. Um, so this is a module that we've developed for Terraform that allows you to create a project and attach it to a bunch of resources and actually create a new one. So I'm going to do, you know, in a new file, copy this over, and customize it for my new project. So in this case, I want to, you know, call it, let's say, demo. And I want to call it, uh, you know, our demo app, right, just, just for today. And then we want to put it in that new folder that we created, right? So that, that folder was dev demo. 
And then part of, you often want to have groups, right? So one of our best practices is to use groups for access management. And as part of the standard tool, you can actually even create the groups for you. Um, if you didn't already have the tool, if you didn't already have the groups available, you just want to you know, get the initial editors for this project in a group. Um, this can actually even create that group for you. So we could say demo devs, and we're going to give them the editor role in the project. Um, we've got some sort of configuration of here, like what billing account to use, what credentials file to use for creating everything and then even an API search account group. Now, my first project only used compute. Let's say I also want to use PubSub on this one. So I just add PubSub in here, right, as an additional declaration, and I could, only, I could have exactly what APIs are going to be activated on the, on the new project defined right here in my code. And then I finally shared VPC, right? We talked a lot about how you want to make sure service accounts get access to the right shared VPC. So here I specify, you know, which which project is my shared VPC host, right? We, we're, this is a service project we're creating, and we want to specify what the host project is. But then even down to the, we can have granularity down to the subnet level. So we don't need to share all the subnets from that host project. We just want to share, let's say, our US central non-prod network, our non-prod subnet, right? So this defines that exactly that subnet is shared and no other ones. Um, Ray mentioned labels as one of our really effective mechanisms for getting additional granularity and info on how your projects work. Um, so you can actually specify some labels for this. So let's say it's, you know, demo app. Cool. And then this is all the config that I need to do to actually create that new project. And then I might want to actually add an output just to, you know, get back the project ID when I'm done. So I could just do, you know, demo and demo here. Cool. So we've got our new config. Everything's looking good. Presumably this would go through some sort of merge request process. So I do some pull request. And then as part of that pull request, somebody would run a Terraform plan. So, you know, I do Terraform plan. So actually first I do init, which will actually take care of downloading the modules from GitHub. So you saw that this one was actually hosted on GitHub. So it'll go out, fetch the modules, fetch the providers, and actually pull everything in. And then I can actually plan it. Cool. So this acquires a state lock, checks everything that currently exists. Right, just doing a bunch of checking. Right, and then you can see, here's all the changes that can be made, right? I'm going to create a new project, right? Here's the new project that's being created and do a bunch of other things in the process. I'm gonna create the new folder, right? So we have to create the folder before we create the new project. We have to attach that new project to our shared VPC. We have to grant um, the new AP, the API service account. So Google always has an API service account associated with every project that is used for any time Google's doing something on your behalf. So for example, a managed instance group, whenever we're in the managed instance group spinning up new VMs, we go through the API service account that Google created. And we want to associate that to the VPC subnets so that anyone that's shared. We want to make sure the group that has access to this project also has access to use those subnets that you're sharing to that project. So we do a role there. And then we do a service account role to VPC subnets. Uh, so we make sure that the service account that's being created gets access to the subnets that are being shared. Because there's a lot of these different, you know, if you want to have those very granular permissions, you have to make sure that you, everything that needs to have access to subnets does have that level of access. And then, as I mentioned, you actually can even have it, um, this automation can even create the G Suite group for you. So it'll create a G Suite group and give it the editor role in that project. And then um, it's going to, you know, create a default service account. So you have one service account to get started with. You could add more service accounts into the configuration if you wanted to. And then, uh, do some membership there. So I'm just going to go ahead and run this. Um, so I'll just do Terraform apply. So it's just running. Say so yes. And it's going to go ahead and create everything. So it, do, it figures out how to parse things in the correct order. So it knows to actually create the folder before it creates the new project, because obviously the folder has to exist for the project to work. And it's going ahead and spinning, up, spinning everything up over time. So it's creating the project, um, doing the subnet association, doing everything there. One thing I do want to call out while it's doing that is something that, that's pretty special about how this works, is it actually will take that API service account um, and put it into a group for you, right? Because by default, service accounts, um, you can have a proliferation of many service accounts within your organization, right? If you, every, service, every project that you create has some service accounts and has multiple service accounts for different APIs. So there's a lot of benefit to actually having groups that group those different service accounts together. So if you wanted to say, say all my service accounts in the organization should be able to pull um, GCE, Im GCE images from a common project, you can just give them a role at the group level, right? So the same way we talked about users being roles, service accounts can also be placed into groups um, 
So that's one thing this does is it actually takes that newly created service account and all the service accounts on that project and puts them to a group for easy administration. Cool. So it takes a, it takes a while for this to actually process everything. Um, so I'm just gonna you know, spin it up, speed it up a little bit. My magic little speed up. Um, and then at the end here, you can see we actually had that output. So for our new ser GCP service account, uh, GCP project, uh, you can actually see, you know, GCP Next 18, simple demo 18, uh, that's our new project that was created. If I wanted to go over here into the project hierarchy, I can actually go ahead and find my folder, right? So Next 18 dev, demo 18, and my app was created. And we see it actually even has Asked to the shared project, shared networks, right? So I did that shared VPC attachment, everything's ready to go, and this team is now onboarded and ready to start using GCP in this sort of standard policy config, standard project. They have all the resources they need to start getting forward. Cool. So that's the demo we have today. I'll welcome Peter Mark up to close this out. So just to reiterate kind of where we started and where we began this talk, um, I showed you the, this migration methodology that we use with our customers when we're trying to migrate uh, large scale environments and data centers and so on, uh, from assess to foundation, deploy, and optimize. And we really zeroed in on the foundation side. Um, and that's because I think it's so important for, uh, for customers to, to actually spend the time, spend the um, energy uh, focusing on this part because really the amount of time that you invest up front in those first two stages in particular when you plan out you find out everything that you have you find out what you want to move and then you create this foundation of what you need um, to move to the cloud is so important it really is such a metric for success for the later stages of migration um, we really feel it's worthwhile spending time uh, to focus in on this and find out uh, what you need to do, and then for us to come out here and do things like this, where we talk about what we think are the best ways to do things like this. Um, there are uh, a couple of sessions that might be interesting if uh, you're, you'd like to see other sessions where people talk about migrations they've gone through. Um, these uh, four sessions are to come uh, in the next couple of days, uh, and I highly recommend them. Uh, unfortunately, a couple of sessions have already passed, um, but all of our sessions are going to be on YouTube in a couple of weeks. Uh, these ones will be worth looking up if you'd like to watch, again, other people's stories about the things they've done. And in particular, I think um, the Velostrata um, session and the Cloud Sprint session, those are both uh, Google-led sessions. Vel Velostrata we re recently acquired. They do VM migrations. And Cloud Sprints is a program by our professional services organization that comes into customers uh, who are beginning a migration um, journey and start, helps them kick that off uh, by creating a well-secured, agile, um, best practices cloud foundation. And on that note, thank you very much. And well, all four of us will be happy to take questions.